going well for you so far. So I have just started recording the session and what we're going to look at tonight is chapter three and the beginning of our, well, beginning and end of our learning unit two. So this is an interesting chapter. Hopefully you'll find it interesting, but also it's really important for your portfolio of evidence. So I'm hoping you guys have managed to read it. Um, it's not difficult to understand. And please um, stop me along the way if you need to ask me anything. So we are going to look at how you and I, how we walk into a shop or we go online, how we choose to purchase products and services. And this is such a fascinating part of marketing because it's really about trying to understand the psychology of human behavior. And what we are interested in when we look at consumer behavior is we're looking at all the influences that occur before we purchase a product or a brand as we are purchasing a product or a brand and afterwards. So that's essentially what consumer behavior is out about, but I'm going to get to that. I think I showed you guys this in the very beginning of our marketing module about how marketing is the coming together of both economics and psychology. And tonight we look at the psychological side, which is really all about what is it that affects and influences us in the choices that we make when we purchase products and services. And if you look at the slide that I'm showing you now, remember this is our whole course on one slide. We are looking, we are looking here. We're starting to look at the people, the target market. And in our next session that when we meet, we'll talk about segmentation, targeting and positioning. But tonight we're trying to understand how people are influenced um, for our potential target markets. So that's essentially where we are in our course. And if we have to properly define consumer behavior, it's a decision making process. And what we do is we select information, we evaluate alternatives, and we make choices to purchase products or not. And there are a variables that help us or really influence us to do that. And I just wanted to give you a page reference because the slide that I'm showing you here, that little diagram, is a little bit small for you to see, but um, it is on page 57 of your textbook. But it's essentially, it's a model of consumer behavior which says, well, how do we make decisions? How do you and I make decisions? Well, we look at all the marketing information that is out there in the market. We understand we are living in, a, in an environment, so we are affected by our income and um, economic variables and cultural variables, etc. And then in the second section here, we start looking at these factors that directly influence the way we make purchasing decisions. And that what, that's what we're going to look at tonight. And this slide that I'm showing you here is a summary of everything. In fact, it's a fantastic slide, and this should really help you um, in terms of your portfolio of evidence and understanding. And what this slide is telling us is that there are individual factors that affect our purchasing decisions, and they are what we call group factors that affect our purchasing decisions. And what we're going to do, we're going to take some examples and we are going to have a look at all of these factors. And I've just got some little examples on the screen up here for you. A jeans, toothpaste, a car, we talk about food. Um, and just to really understand what these elements mean. So... We obviously know what our POE is all about. We know that we are looking at the car industry. Um, that is not the car brand that we are particularly interested in at the moment. We are looking at the bike. And there is a nice example 
Um, that's one of the models of the bike um, products that are in South Africa. And what we're going to do is look at some of the factors that will actually influence the purchasing of a car. So these are some of the elements, lifestyle, personality, perception. Um, there are certain people that influence us, um, family, culture, etc. And what are the motives that um, stimulate me to purchase a car? So when we are talking, we are going to talk um, about a car in particular because that's our whole portfolio of evidence and any other elements that um, you can think of or that you want to talk about. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the concept of motivation. And motivation is very easy to understand. It is about us meeting the need. I am motivated to buy a hamburger because I am hungry. I am motivated to buy a car because I need to be able to get to work and back. The nature and the type of food or car that I buy um, is all about the different type of motivation that I have. So when purchasing a product or a service, we are motivated by various elements. We can be motivated purely by hunger, in which case we don't really care what we eat, or in the case of purchasing a car, not only are we motivated by um, being able to have transport, but we might also be motivated by esteem needs and being part of a group, having a better car, something that fits into your social circle. So motivation is a big factor that affects us. The next factor is what is called perception. And we all have these perceptions. We all know what a perception is. It is how we see a, the world, a brand, a product, an organization. And perceptions are quite difficult to change, actually. So we all have perceptions based on experience, based on what we've heard. And if we take an example of, say, a new brand in the South African market, like the um, bike um, cars, we, we don't really know a lot about that. Or we might perceive that particular brand to be not as good as a Toyota or a Suzuki, etc. And um, our perceptions are based on what we know to be true. So another example would be we have a perception that Woolworths has high quality products and services in the country. So perception also influences our purchasing decisions. Um, that's a little bit of detail that you don't really need. Um, another aspect that we need to look at is our attitudes. And we we all have particular attitudes to learning um, to brands and um, products. And an attitude is really a we've learned it. It's a learned predisposition to behave consistently towards or against something. So I wanted to give you um, an example, certain companies that pollute the environment, I have an attitude of I'm not purchasing that particular product or service. We might have very favorable attitudes towards companies that treat their staff right. We might have favorable attitudes towards companies that um, have very good sustainability strategies, such as Woolworths, etc. We may have very favorable attitudes towards strong car brands in South Africa that we know well, such as a Toyota, a Suzuki. Um, so attitude, our attitudes really influence how we purchase a particular product or service, as does personality. And if we had to define personality, we'd have to say, well, it's our, our internal characteristics. These are the elements that make us uh, specific to ourselves. So we could be outgoing. We could be very introverted. We could be very dramatic. We could be very um, excitement orientated. 
Um, and in fact, personality is one of those elements that marketers know greatly influences products and services like cars, like clothing, um, like food, like holidays. Um, personality is very linked as well to the other element of lifestyle. And lifestyle is really about the choices that we make, what we do with our time, how we choose to spend time, um, and um, what, our, what our hobbies, where we live, what are the elements that affect us on a daily basis. I just want to go back to our, um, our pick of the car now. And there we go. Let's go to the, the bike. So we've looked at some of, there's a nice, um, that's the 4x4, the B40. We've looked at some of the elements. So if we were looking at particular, if we had the need to purchase a car, something like a lifestyle would affect whether we purchase this product or not. Do we go off-road? Do we go into game reserves? Do we need a 4x4? Um, as would the individual element of personality. Um, do we enjoy the the shape of the car, the design of the car? Does it does it suit my personality? Um, other element is here with this brand. Do we have a good perception of the brand? What do we know about the brand? Do we think that this brand is reliable, like a Toyota? Do we think that oh, it's a Chinese car, so um, is it as good as a Renault or a Volkswagen or something? What What is our perception of this particular car? And also, what, what is it that motivates us? What do we need the car for? Um, to drive on the weekends, to get from A to B? You know, what are the needs that are being met in purchasing my product or service? So we can see that all these different individual elements affect the purchasing of a, of a brand. Motivation, learning is just the, what we mean by that is when we have, for example, gone into Nando's, purchased a new a new meal, come out, really enjoyed the, the meal and um, positive experience, you will go back and purchase that meal again. We learn based on experience. So, what we are saying that all these factors affect product behavior and consumer buying patterns. Let's have a look at the group factors now. So if we're looking at um, this particular car or a car or even clothing, whatever it may be, is that who are the people that influence me? Um, we look at very specific groups actually here. Um, family. Now, we all come from families, very different families in South Africa, and family has been regarded as one of the strongest influences of consumer behavior in the world. How we grew up, where family is very linked to culture, um, and we are very, very influenced by the members of our family. If we have grown up in a particular family that has only ever owned a particular brand of car or even had a particular type of dog or lived in a particular suburb, we are influenced by that because we have a certain um, knowledge of that and we are used to particular products and services. The same with culture. We grow up in cultures where culture very much influences food and clothing and brands and cars and needs um, as a whole. So these group factors are very linked to what are the types of people that influence us um, when purchasing products and services. Now, if you are in the market to buy a car, the person in your family might be very different, the person that you consult with, um, to a person um, if you were going to purchase running shoes. You might go to your father or your brother or somebody who works in the um, car industry um, to purchase a car, but you might go to your, um, a, run, a cousin who runs if you're purchasing running shoes. 
So it very much depends on the type of product and the um, nature of, of what you are purchasing. Culture as well, as we said, is very, very linked to that. And other elements that we need to look at is what is called a reference group. And I'm going to show you a couple of slides here. But a reference group is essentially a group that we are part of or we want to be part of or a group that influences us. So to give you an example, if you are purchasing running shoes, a reference group for you in purchasing new running shoes would be your um, running club. So all the people that um, have quite a bit of experience with running, um, that would be an important reference group. Other examples of reference groups are church groups, student bodies, schools, families, any groups of people where they could potentially influence you um, in terms of products and services. And reference groups are very closely linked to what we call opinion leaders. And these are people who, for one reason or another, um, could strongly influence our purchasing of a particular car, um, living in a particular neighborhood, a type of financial product, whatever it may be, people that we trust, people that we hold in high esteem. And opinion leaders range from sports people to influencers, um, to parents, whatever they may be. So let's just go and have a look at um, some of the, the slides that talk about those group factors. Yeah, so as I said, the family, and um, it really depends as well on the type of family that you have. Um, in South Africa, we have all sorts of different families. We have child-headed and a lot of um, women-headed households. Um, we have grandparent-headed households. So the, the family is um, not, I suppose, it depends on what type of family you are part of and there's some just some examples of family types husband dominated wife dominated the nuclear family the good old mom dad and 2.2 children um child dominated families as are suggested also we talked about the cultural group um we know what culture is it's kind of our shared beliefs and norms and how we behave in society, how we grew up, what we learned um, growing up. And really, it is one of the biggest determinants of consumer behavior. Food, as I said, food and clothing and pretty much every type of product or service is influenced by the culture from which we are growing. Social class as well. Social class is kind of the group of people that we fit into in society. Um, education and income are two very important elements of social class. Um, uh, people in the same social classes have similar behavior patterns. They also have similar um, income patterns. So um, higher social classes would be able to afford more expensive clothing, food, cars, etc. Um, and yes, so social class is certainly a determinant of consumer behavior. We also talked about reference groups, as I said, being part of a group that will influence your decisions um, and uh, gave you the example of a running club. Um, automatic groups, you could, you're automatically a student because you are part of a student body at this um, particular time. You could be part of a work group, um, a company that you work for. Um, you could also aspire towards certain groups. You could aspire to own a particular car and be part of the Porsche Club or something like that. But um, reference groups are those people that we use to help us make decisions. And in this case, consumer buying decisions. As I said, an opinion leader um, is somebody who is part of a reference group, can stand alone, um, with whom we will consult when purchasing certain products and services. And this is often the case 
um, when purchasing very expensive products and services, such as a car. And a reference person could be a, um, a family member who knows a lot about cars, somebody older, wiser than you. It could be a person that works in the industry. Um, it could be somebody who is part of a, um, um, a car industry body, whatever it may be. But an opinion leader, again, is somebody that you, you consult when making buying decisions. Are there any questions on those factors? Um, I just want to go back to our car, um, our bike, B40. Uh, are there any questions? Does that make sense to you guys in terms of what influences us when we purchase products and services, particularly um, because we are talking about our, um, our particular company here and our brand? Okay, so just to summarize, does this car suit our personalities, our lifestyles? What do we perceive about this brand? Um, is there a family history in, in this particular industry of a particular car or another um, competitor? Um, who would I consult in purchasing a particular car? And what is it that would motivate me to purchase this particular car, as opposed to a non-SUV or a sedan or another brand or something like that. So all these factors impact and affect how we make buying decisions, even down to the silly little chocolate. So what I want to, those are those two groups. Um, group factors and individual factors are very important um, in terms of your portfolio of evidence. Part of this chapter as well looks at a process that we go through when we are making decisions. And regardless of what kind of product or service we are purchasing, we go through these different types of decisions. And I just want to go through it very briefly with you because it's not part of your POE, but just important for you to understand in the grander scheme of things. But when we are first going out to purchase a product, so just let's use the car as an example. You are a nice little nuclear family and you are about to have a third child and you go, oh my goodness, our tiny little car is not big enough. That is what we call need recognition in marketing, where we know that we need, we are motivated to, um, to resolve our needs and our car at the moment is not going to meet our needs. That is need recognition. So what do we do? We then go into what is called information search. We start looking around. We say, well, we need a much bigger car and we are going to look for a seven-seater. Um, and we start looking in the market, we are consulting people and um, uh, all sorts of marketing, marketing material going online, and we are searching for information. The next stage that we look at is we then have a number of alternatives, and we're looking, we say, well, we've got three different alternatives, the Mazda's great, the Chevrolet and the Toyota, each one of them has different pros and cons. Um, so let's have a look and sit down and work it out. Next stage is you have made your decision. You've looked at your alternatives and you've decided between your three choices that the Toyota is the way to go, why it's available, it's reasonable, you like the style, you get it in a color that you like, and you make your decision. The final component of consumer decision making is after the, the, the purchase, what we call cognitive dissonance or post-purchase behavior. And this is when you have been driving your Toyota for a few weeks and you either can go either way. You go, gosh, I'm so happy I purchased this particular car because of X, Y, and Z, or, oh my goodness, I wish that I had purchased the Mazda. 
the Toyota is not as efficient, fuel efficient as I anticipated. And um, yes, it doesn't drive as nicely. So those are the decision making um, steps that we all follow regardless of what we are purchasing. The last kind of component of our theory that we just briefly need to have a look at is the different types of decision makings that we have as people. And this, this is nice and easy because we can understand them. Real decision making means when we are buying something that is quite expensive and requires a lot of information search. This is an example of buying a car. It's a complex um, you need to go out and evaluate alternatives. Um, because it's expensive, you put quite a lot of time and effort into it. That is what we call real decision making. Impulse decision making, and this is why um, uh, our supermarkets are so well designed. This is very unplanned um, purchasing. So this is when we are in a checkout queue at Checkers, and we've got a whole trolley full, and my goodness, we just buy three different types of chocolates going down the aisle because um, our merchandising, the merchandising is so good. So impulse decision making is when we are not actually planning to purchase a product. Uh, walking past a shoe store, seeing a pair of shoes, going in and going, right, I've got to have those. That is something that is unplanned. And then the last kind of decision making we have is what we call habitual. And this is when you and I, we have a particular coffee brand. I'm a Nescafe classic person, and um, I do not put a whole lot of effort into purchasing coffee. It's habitual. I um, go in and I automatically take a um, jar of Nescafe um, gold or classic. So it's just something that we don't put any effort into. So those are our three types of decision makings. And that's the theory that I wanted to go through with you tonight. I want to show you um, where this fits into your POE. But before I do that, are there any questions about the theory? Okay, all right, so what I'm going to do is, as from the beginning, we are going to have a look at your POE. I'm really hoping that you guys have had a good look at your POE now, because um, we are kind of getting to the point where we now need to look at it in quite a bit of detail. So, as I said to you guys last week, it's broken down into three different parts, but at the moment, we are only interested in part one. So, let's go and have a look. Let me just get this up here. There we go. We know what our POE is all about. We are looking at this particular car manufacturer. Um, the problem is that um, their sales are poor, and we need to find out um, why and to solve the problem, how do we sell a product to a market that does not appear to want it? My goodness, every marketer's nightmare. So this is the, the case study that you have been given. And if we have a look at, we're going to look at task A because this is the theory we just had a look at. So task A is um, about designing a customer survey. So task A says a marketer cannot create customer value without information. How do we find out about how we as South Africans see the bike products? What do we do? And we need to find out how consumers um, think and what we feel about the brand, if we even know it. And we also need to try and establish with the individual factors, i.e. motivation, lifestyle, personality, all those things we have looked at, and group factors um, impact um, our, how we think and feel. So your first task 
in your um, POE is to design and conduct a customer survey with 15 people, 15 people that you know from your circle of friends and family, and you have to determine three different things. Um, from these questions that you're going to ask the 15 people that you know, that's very important, you need to establish the current level of brand awareness of bike in South Africa. So how many people know about the brand? How many people have ever heard about the brand? Um, anything that is related to that brand. That's the first thing that you guys need to find out is what is the level of brand awareness of this particular company? The second thing that you need to find out is to be able to assess the individual and group factors that impact on, on customer perception of the brand. So you're trying to determine with which individual factors and which group factors would influence the people that you are surveying um, to, that would influence them purchasing this particular brand. What is it? Is it um, culture? Is it family? Is it lifestyle? Um, is it um, a particular reference group? So we are trying to understand how people feel about bike and what influences their behavior. Once you have completed the survey, you need to write a report outlining your findings. Um, your findings on the perception of the bike brand and the factors that impact the perception of this particular brand. Um, we are not going to go into the details of the report now, et cetera, because we're going to do that in our national support session. I just wanted to show you how we are relating what we've been through tonight to our portfolio of evidence. Um, so you need to write a report, but we'll go through that in detail closer to the time. And then this report also needs to include at least five recommendations on how to improve the bike brand um, in terms of awareness and perception in the South African market. So that is how we are relating our chapter three to our portfolio of evidence tonight. Are there any questions on what you are tasked with um, for your task A? We're not going to go through task B because we're going to do that next time. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, does anybody feel concerned about um, types of questions you would ask? Anybody worried about, um, my goodness, how would I, how would I, elicit that information. Oh, it made it too easy for you guys. We've tried to help you. How's this? So this is a list of questions. Um, this is a list of questions that we have put together for you for your survey. It is 12 questions here. OK. And we want you all to use those 12 questions because it will really help you. You are going to get, um, you are going to get marked on the information that you glean out of these questions. But what we want you each to do is to add one of your own to each um, area. So here you are required, and we'll go into this in more detail again when we go through your national support session. So these questions need to be created in a Google form. Um, we have given you 12 of the 15 questions. We want you guys to create three questions of your own. One that will give you information on the level of brand awareness of the company. One that will give you information on the individual factors influencing decisions. 
and one that will give you information on group flat factors that influence decisions. So I want you to start thinking about that. We've also attached to this, and I'm going to post this and send it to you guys and put it under more resources as well. We've attached how to um, create a Google survey on Google Forms, and there are the questions um, that should help you in eliciting the information that you need. So as I said, we just want you to start thinking about those three questions that you need to um, add to your survey. But the detail of this, we are going to go through um, a little bit closer to the time when we go through our national support session. Just want to give you an example. Um, and a lot of these questions are yes and no, because it makes it that it's what is called a closed ended questionnaire meaning that you don't have long, open answers from people. You're just trying to get short um, yes or no or very short answers from people. So, for example, have you ever heard of the brand buy? I mean, that's the first question. Do you know what type of products? Um, do you have a positive view of the brand? And so we go. So we are just trying to build up an understanding of the brand awareness. Um, of this company and what are the factors that influence decision making here. So those were the three elements that I wanted to show you tonight um, to go through the group and individual factors with you and your textbook actually it's so well written this textbook the, the latest edition is so nicely put together um, it's got quite a bit of detail um, but not too much. So I'm hoping that you've read it or please read it, but you, you shouldn't really have a problem with this. Um, so I wanted to go through that, show you where you are using this information in your PRE, and then show you the questions that we have already designed for you, and then to for you to start thinking about the ones that you need to start yourselves. So... That's all I wanted to share. Um, what about from your guys? Everybody good. Everybody know what to do. Everybody happy with the um, Connor. So to to design your survey, if you go and have a look at Google Forms, you will see it's just um, how you design it. You're just putting it into a document. Um, can you share the survey with your peers if we don't have enough people? Well, what we mean by what you need to do is you have to survey 15 people that you know. So it, it can be pretty much 15 people. Um, I'm sure that you, you know 15 people, but you have to know them. So peers are people that you know, um, not necessarily in this particular group, I think if that's what you meant, then no, because you don't know the other people in the group. So it would be people that you that are familiar to you, and that's just a research um, academic um, factor because you are um, first year students and because of the way research is designed. So if you go have a look very specifically at your portfolio, portfolio of evidence, it has to be people that you know. Uh, does that answer your question? Um, anything else?
Okay, guys, well, if that's, if there are no other questions, um, that's really what I wanted to cover. Um, please have a look when we meet next week, not next week, the week after, we're going to go through the final part of your um, task one for your POE. We're also going to do the national support session attached to it. So we're going to cover your chapter four, and then you will have covered everything that you need for the first part of your portfolio of evidence. But please have a look at this chapter, go through your POE, have a look at the questions. If you have any better suggestions, please let me know as well. I would really welcome them. If you think of um, any questions that would be better, um, then gosh, I would be delighted to hear. Um, but if there is nothing else, then thank you so much for your time. I will share this on more resources as usual. I will email it to you. I will also, the document that I've got up here um, at the moment, I will also email it and put it under more resources for you separately. So you've got it um, at, your, at your disposal at any time. So thank you very much for your time then this evening. And um, yes, I'm in touch. You can be in touch by email. I will be sending you and keeping in touch with you um, along the weeks. And um, next week, I'll be sending you some more videos for the following week when we look at segmentation, targeting, and positioning. And enjoy the rest of your evening. So thank you very much. Um, Connor, just to answer your question, no, it was your first ask task, and it's a contribution um, ask task. So if you do all your ask tasks, you get a full ten percent. Yes. So um, when to, to yeah, it actually does count, but it counts for your ten percent. But you got a hundred percent for it if you handed it in. So I hope that helps. <laughs> All right, um, Tego, please then email me and just let me know that. Okay, and then I can work that out. All right, thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your evening.